trans people can uh, just now without a gender recognition certificate socially transition. Can you set out what difference it makes for a trans person to have a gender recognition certificate? What rights it would secure that they otherwise wouldn't have? And why are they important? Um, and so whilst it is, whilst a gender recognition certificate is not actually that consequential in all of that many circumstances when it comes to how trans people are able to live our lives and the rights that it gives to us, it is important to trans people to be recognised and to have the reality of who we are and how we move through the world properly shown and represented on our identity documents and also properly kind of seen and believed by the state. So please just take a second to think about that, how it might feel knowing that you might be outed because your paperwork doesn't match or because the gender you're presenting at doesn't match your documentation. Indeed for both, but particularly for the reflection period, this is detrimental to those at the end of their life and could result in individuals not having their true gender reflected on their death certificate. And if you think about that individual then on their death certificate, everything else not matching, not being able to bury, be, be buried or cremated with their, with their true gender, that, um, I hate to use the word fear, but it just doesn't seem that it's, it, it's right. You're 16, so children and young people would continue to not be able to have identity documents that reflect who they are and how they live their lives. Um, and, you know, the main things that it does do is it can make, you know, administrative tasks um, you know, around you know, making applications and things like that a lot bit easier. Um, it um, can change how you are um, you know, recorded after you've passed away um, on your death certificate. Um, in terms of uh, the one other thing that it does, which is around marriage certificates and how people are recorded um, after getting married, um, then um, that's the only instance in which that might affect someone else. But what you've just said. Lucy, in, in your opening remarks, you, you talked about opening this up to a more diverse group, a wider group. What do you mean by wider thank you, group? Thank you. That's a very important question. So it's presented very much as we're just changing the admin for a set group. But when you look back at 2004, the group that's legislated for was deliberate. They, they expected it to be the 5,000 or so people that it is. And it was very deliberately pegged around people. And Justice Schofield, as I said, went through, it's very interesting judgment, went through the background of 2004 yeah. Act and how it was very much intended for this very tightly defined group. And EHRC has made the same point. One of the problems about removing any kind of medical oversight, however you construct it, is that you open it up to anyone who is willing to make the declaration. And what you see being laid out in front of you is a really different conceptualization of the population of interest to politicians here. There's a much broader group of people. Um, in some of you have got written evidence, people saying that they don't think you should have the acquired gender period because you might not be able to live in your acquired gender. People want you to say that they should be able to apply for a GRC regardless of whether they've made changes. You have, um, and that, that was actually answered in the Spice Briefing, but some of your written evidence, people make the same points. I think Ellie made some of the same points too. But the population that's talked about, the umbrella, the trans umbrella now, is radically different in its composition. It's bigger, it's more diverse. Um, and I always say, well, once you have opened to a wider population, and the public know that you've opened the GRC to a wider population, it may include six foot two blokes, people who look like blokes with a big beard, then how is the public supposed to know when a six foot two person with a beard who looks like a guy walks into a girl's changing room, how are they supposed to know whether this person has a GRC, is trans identified or not? And there's a huge loophole here that it would be great if finally, after the four years of this bill being talked about, that politicians would finally consider how they could close that loophole. There was a strong level of support from consultees for the importance of the Commission's role advising on law and policy related to how sex and gender-based rights should be balanced. This is the context in which our board wanted to review the issues against our statutory remit to regulate a legal framework that protects nine overlapping protected characteristics.
This remit requires us to consider how the rights of one person or group might be affected by those of others in light of the law we regulate. Balancing overlapping rights can be complex and challenging. In the case of reform of the Gender Re Recognition Act, we reached the position that more detailed consideration is needed before legislative change is made. This is because of the continued lack of certainty about the practical consequences for individuals and society of extending the ability to change legal sex from a defined group with a recognised medical condition who have demonstrated their commitment and ability to live in their acquired gender to a wider group. Questions continue to be raised in different quarters about potential consequences, for example, in relation to the collection and use of data, participation and drug testing in competitive sport, measures to address barriers facing women and practices within the criminal justice system. So the proposed reform would reduce the age of eligibility to age 16 and remove all gatekeeping for, for a GS, GRC. So effectively, this is then based on self-identification. And what that means is that you're opening up what was a very small group of people um, suffering particular psychological distress to a potentially much larger group of people and a more diverse group of people as well. And as I've said, that does have implications for data collection. It decouples sex, you know, biological sex, natal sex from legal sex for a larger group of people. We don't know how many and we don't know how they'll be distributed in the population. And what that means is that when organisations choose to collect legal sex rather than biological sex, the impact will be much larger because there'll be a much larger group of people for whom those two things are decoupled. Uh, there was no common reason across all jurisdictions why people advocated for the removal of a diagnosed requirement. But there were some which we could pick out as themes and which I think are really important. So lack of accessibility, right? The problem that people couldn't access the diagnosed requirements that they were that was necessary to get. And that's, of course, something that you have already heard about here. Uh, issues about contraindications and diagnosis. So medical complications across Europe, which prevent people from being able to access a diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Also something we've seen within the UK context. The symbolism of not being the person who is able to advocate your gender, right? The indignity of having to go to a third party and to say, actually, you need to tell me who I are, who I am. If you look at international soft law, at least one of the common themes you can see is people saying, listen, even if we don't agree there needs to be self-ID, we do need that the process needs to be quick, quick, transparent and accessible. And the diagnosis requirement has been considered both across Europe and across the European Union and the Council of Europe as being a major obstacle to that question of, of, of quick and transparency. It creates a huge amount of time. The way that the bill is proposed is the potential unintended consequences uh, actually on uh, the trans community it itself in terms of if if that is one of the main ways in which it's um, assessed as to how someone obtains a GRC, then that potentially opens it up to people misusing the system. So I'm not suggesting there isn't room for improvement at all. What concerns me is the absence of any objective assessment of who might be trans and who therefore might be entitled to a gender recognition certificate and no gatekeeping as we've described it and the impact on the Equality Act and the cohort of people uh, who might be able to access single sex services. My answer to that is simply that there need to be clear criteria. Um, we need to know what, what the conditions are that justify the grant of a gender recognition certificate because it has these quite far-reaching effects and consequences. Um, and if it is simply, in effect, available on request, um, I think that is capable of having some very damaging effects. Um, so I don't think it's about um, discriminating against any particular group it's just about it's just it's about gatekeeping in the in the best sense this you know before you um provide benefits to people before you people need to show that they need them or show that they're entitled to them 
Um, and this, this particular sort of benefit, a state recognition of a new um, official sex, legal sex, um, is something that it, it, it's reasonable to expect some quite serious um, uh, proof of um, entitlement to. Who are those people that you think will come forward for a gender recognition certificate that are not yet known to any services or organisations? I don't see how we know the answer to that question. Um, if you're saying you can have a gender recognition certificate because you say um, on the basis of self-identification, you make it very easy for anyone who wants one for any purpose. But I would be very surprised if that purpose wasn't sometimes identity laundering. Okay. So, and that's a particular worry. I mean, you, you, you yourself have called the process, um, I think you said, solemn and serious. Mm. So do, do you think if it is a solemn and serious process, which is um, to, to access a gender recognition certificate, um, that, that people will do that? use it for those purposes? Yes, I do. I think some people have very strong reasons for wanting to launder their identities. You know, there are, there are criminals as well as good, well-meaning people in the world, and we need to have laws that are robust to um, people with bad intentions as well as... Uh, we, we can't make law on the, base, on the assumption that everyone who might possibly use this law is going to do so with the best of intentions. They have to be robust. We don't know who the cohort or the size of the cohort, if the bill is enacted. Um, but we can assume it's much larger because one of the complaints about the present system is that people can't access a GRC where they want one. So we can assume it's much larger. Who they will be, we don't know because there's no gatekeeping, no threshold, no medical intervention or objective assessment. Living as a woman, as I've already said, gives rise to the sorts of stereotyping we've, we've spoken about. What does living as a woman mean? I don't know. Um, what does it mean to live as a woman? I often spend an entire semester talking to my students about what does it mean to live as a woman. Um, that is an incredibly complicated question. I am, as much as anybody, as suspicious and sceptical of gender stereotypes. Um, but... It cannot simply just be the bit, the reproductive bits that you have. Feminists for decades have been arguing that we should not reduce what it means to be a woman to our reproductive organs, to our bodily autonomy and so on. And so therefore, an understanding of what it means to live as a woman is complex, is nuanced, is maybe not something we can capture in a bill or an act. But it, 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 from, it, from my perspective, from the perspective of much feminist research, it cannot simply be just biological elements. A trans uh, woman raised the definition of an acquired gender and put the question back to um, the women in the committee and said, what confirms, um, what traits do you demonstrate that confirms that you are living as a woman? And I just wondered, for the purposes of the bill, if we are to reform it and make legislation better, um, do you, does the Scottish Government consider that there should be a definition of what it is to uh, of acquired gender? Living uh, in the acquired gender generally means living your, your daily life in a gender that is different from your, your gender recorded at birth. Um, the requirement, I think this is important to say, this is not about dressing or looking a, a certain way. It's about the ways a, a person may demonstrate their lived gender uh, to others. So um, ultimately, interpretation um, you know, is um, it, can you give us an example? yes, I can. I was just about going on uh, to say so consistently using um, you know titles uh, and pronouns in line with the acquired gender, updating official documents such as a, a driving license or passport, updating utility bills or bank accounts, updating the the gender marker on official documents such as a driving license or passport, uh, describing themselves and being described by others in written or other communication in line with the acquired gender, using a name associated with the acquired gender, although change of name is of course a personal choice and not required. <laughs>
one of the things, if I take a step back, um, that we asked civil servants when we met them was what kind of option analysis there had been of op alternatives to taking out the diagnosis of gender dysphoria when they were looking at the bill. And one of the things we were surprised to learn was that they hadn't looked at any other alternatives that retained any form of medical gatekeeping. They had gone straight to just the self-ID model. And that, that bothered me as a former civil servant that there'd been over all this period no kind of option appraisal of different ways. Um, am I right in saying, Lucy, that you had said that no other alternatives to self-declaration had been explored? That's um, correct. That's what the civil servants told us. Um, if I'm correct, the Scottish Trans Alliance welcomed the lowering of the minimum age, but they also state that there should be provisions for individuals struggling with their application to request support. And these should be especially sensitive to those under 18 who may be applying without the support of a parent or a guardian. They go on to say, explainers on what GRC means and how it could be used would be helpful. Would you say that if individuals of a certain age are unable to understand what a GRC means and how it would be used and require additional support to submit and understand an application that perhaps lowering the minimum age would be unwise. There are many, many reasons why an individual might need um, additional documentation, additional support, those with um, additional support needs. Um, I, I certainly have... Um, there, there are certainly people out there who might, for example, su suffer, or not suffer, but have dyslexia or um, yeah, need support to translate written information in, into uh, forms that you might want to submit. The sad thing is we know the majority of kids with dysphoria eventually grow out of it. We also know the vast majority, if left alone, will grow up to be happy young lesbians, gays or bisexuals. That's why we have a particular concern about lowering the age at which someone can get a GRC to 16. If the state steps in to validate the confused feelings of a 16-year-old girl who thinks she's a boy, this risks crystallising an identity that's just temporary. It also makes it harder for her to revert to feeling like a girl now that she's been told by the state she really is a boy. The majority of young people with gender dysphoria will desist um, and, and become settled in their, their biological sex, uh, as much as 85% in a study from 2016. I think in terms of children, um, I think that there are, you know, there's good reasons to protect children from making permanent legal declarations regarding their gender and, and also good reason to question opening up a pathway to puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and other uh, potentially irreversible uh, treatments um, and, and, and surgery um, and the long-term effects of, of a lot of that is, remains unclear. But the default position is people are the sex they are um, and if they want to be legally recognised as a different sex um, that is a radical step and that is an even more radical step than the social transition that worries Hilary Cass um, as a serious intervention for children and young people. So we would Definitely uh, think that the, until the cash review concludes that um, it, it shouldn't be reduced to 16 and then see what comes of that because the interim report said that young people's gender identity can remain in flux until they're at mid-20s. The Convention on the Rights of the Child says very clearly that, that when you're putting in place something for protection, for example, in relation to the justice system and the age of criminal responsibility, um, what you're looking to do is put in place a very high age of um, things like criminal responsibility or where the minimum age is necessary to correct potential abuses in relation to things like um, sexual consent, then you need to make sure that the children's rights aren't damaged through that process. But where age restrictions don't serve a protective um, purpose and potentially curb children's rights to development and their freedoms, then minimum ages should, should be avoided. And so in situations where you've got that tension between protection and autonomy, which, which comes up a lot in relation to things like consent and medical treatment, um, you should be looking to, to the, the capacity uh, that the Register General might have in assessing a child's understanding or capacity, um, because that would generally be on, only appropriate for a suitably qualified um, professional or, or medical professional in other areas of children's lives. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, one of its, its core uh, approaches is to recognise the evolving capacities of children. Um, and to balance that up with providing them 
with protection where that is needed. Um, I, I noted that the Children's Commissioner did highlight that minimum age requirements require more scrutiny where they are acting to curb children's freedoms. Um, as opposed to serving a protective function, so a protective function like in the justice system. Um, excluding young people from access to gender recognition procedures would be a curb to their right to private and family life, so um, we would uh, not be in favour of imposing unnecessary minimum age requirements. So in the, the children's bill, there is mm -hmm. an assumption that a young person has the capacity to right. make a decision unless um, someone else, um, on a case-by-case -case basis, yeah. unless a professional says otherwise. Mm -hmm. Would you consider that that would be a useful addition to this bill to well, protect? I, th I think that people? is assumed, I mean, due to the age of legal capacity, um, really establishing that young people from 16 upwards have the ability to enter into legal contracts. Um, now, I know that there are various ages for various things. I, I understand all of that. But I think the fact that we have um, uh, we have agreed that from 16 years onwards, young people are able uh, to make those decisions for themselves and have the legal capacity. Um, now, there are issues for the Registrar General around capacity more generally, not just young people. holders and also in future all those who claim they've already obtained gender recognition overseas will benefit from section 22. The committee therefore needs to consider what it means to extend such strong protection to a much larger more diverse group including young people still in school based purely on self-declaration. Three years ago the Scottish Government said it would tighten section 22 but instead the bill extends its reach. The Section 22 provisions are really heavy duty, heavy, heavy duty privacy protections. They are witness protection type stuff. They should not be handed out lightly. I am really worried, leaving aside anything to do with sort of bad actors, sexual. I'm extremely worried that we are looking at a state identity protection scheme which you can get by walking in and swearing, and swearing a declaration. There would be unintended consequences of not having uh, a medical diagnosis in that it may, um, as some um, have highlighted, shield a criminal. Um, so therefore um, it provides them sort of with an in invisible cloak from their past and that removes the safeguards. In my view, I mean, I think it's open to the committee, as I said, to look at alternatives. Um, but I don't see that that I don't see that that in itself um, is a sufficient concern um, in order to stop the reform that is proposed. There's some protection against inappropriate actions by officialdom um, and an ability not to bump into someone who takes a prurient interest as to why one of your documents is different from another one of your documents. Uh, and that degree of protection from proposals like um, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a proposal to make police forces record the sex of victims, for example, that's floating around at the moment. How can it be possibly relevant if you've been burgled that your uh, legal sex is different from your gender identity? Now, having some protection by, via Section 22 obviously would be helpful in a circumstance like that. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
Um, Professor Sullivan, do you have any, any comment on that particular aspect? Yeah, Section 22 is, is a really um, interesting example of the unintended consequences of um, the original legislation in 2004, because the privacy requirement was obviously meant to apply to this very small group of transsexual people who might not be obviously or openly trans. Um, when we combine that with self-ID, it, um, it makes a lot less sense. But it was never, ever intended, and if you read the Hansard of the, the 2004 legislation passing through Parliament, it never mentioned data collection, and it, it's very clear that, you know, this was about marriage. For a long time, people were not collecting data on sex because they believed and had been advised that that would violate Section 22. Now, that has since been quite clarified, and it's clear that, in fact, it does not contravene Section 22 to collect data on sex. But we went through many years where we were losing data on sex, partly because people had misinterpreted the law. Now, I think as legislators, you've got to be really mindful of that. It's not just what your intended consequences are from this legislation. You've got to think really carefully about the unintended consequences. As the National Agency for Sport, our vision is of an active Scotland where everyone benefits from sport. We have a clear commitment to inclusion underpinning everything we do. Legis legislative provision currently exists to allow sports bodies to place restrictions on trans people participating in sport in certain specified circumstances if that is necessary to uphold fair competition or the safety of competitors. Those provisions are set out in section 195 of the Equality Act and will not be impacted by the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. Um, we cannot see any where uh, which will impact section 195 of the Equality Act. Thank you. Sports Scotland's understanding is that it does not impact on section 195 of the Equality Act. Um, the, the vast majority of trans people uh, and uh, uh, folks in our network um, have been taking part in sport for many years. Um, and have been doing so without the need for a gender recognition certificate um, and been doing so in a way that has been welcomed by the, the participants um, and team members that they have. We believe the emerging evidence does not support the view that testosterone suppression for 12 months will achieve parity of strength, stamina and physique for transgender women compared with females. Um, as a result, that's the rationale for our for our for our position and the guidance that you can't necessarily at all times balance um, safety, inclusion, and competitive fairness. So it's not necessarily the case that sports would adopt a even within a sport a one size approach, a one policy approach across the whole sport. You might take a different policy at grassroots community club level to the national championships, for example. So I, th I think. Unsurprisingly, um, the guidance doesn't make everyone happy. Um, it takes a, a view that, governing, uh, that sports will have to come up and work on their own position, so it's also not a, a final statement on what, this, what actually the outcomes will be on a sport-by-sport -sport basis. Um, but there are not... We were never expecting everyone to be happy. Um, I think in relation to the release of the new guidance, um, we see the vast majority of trans people uh, and athletes who haven't welcomed the guidance. Um, they believe that the approach that it's taken and the tone that it takes is hostile to their inclusion in sport. What we do but know is that there are female athletes um, who'd be really happy to speak to the committee and, and we, you know, we would encourage you to get them and to talk to them about how it is on ground. But just talking about that evidence session, because I sat, I sat listening and what really struck me was all the way through, there was not a single reference to Section 22. You know, as, as parliamentarians, you have an enormous responsibility to society to set that tone. And so if you are saying to people, we believe that the only criteria as to whether you're a man or a woman is self-identity, it becomes increasingly harder for individual organisations to have a policy that is in opposition to that. And that's what we've seen. And then 
the reality then becomes the person making these decisions is often, say, a lowly paid receptionist at the sports centre who is trying to tell somebody they can't go into a woman only session. And it's it they are not sure of their protections, they are not sure of the law, and they really, really need clarity. Um, and because, as Lucy said, it's such a contested and confused area and people don't have that clarity, the practical implications of doing this will affect areas like sport, even though, even though it is possible to carve out the exceptions under the Equality Act. So could you set out what you think the implications of a legal G the effect of a GRC are, um, and in particular how you you view the relationship between the GRC and the Equality Act? I mean, it, it is very complex, I would say, um, to start with. Um, so broadly, the relationship between the Gender Recognition Act and the Equality Act um, is that the gender recognition certificate has the effect of changing how someone's sex is recognised in law, including in, in the Equality Act under the sex discrimination provisions. Um, so um, a trans woman with a GRC under um, the Equality Act would be treated as a, as a woman for the purpose of the sex discrimination provisions. Um, a trans woman without a GRC would be legally male under the sex provision. The Scottish Government asserts that GRC does not change rights under the Equality Act, but has not produced a reasoned explanation for its position. The EHRC letter to Translegal in July 2021 states, we think it's unlikely that a trans person without a GRC can claim direct discrimination on the grounds of gender reassignment if they are denied access to the single or separate sex service that corresponds with their lived gender. As, a, as I was explaining before, um, a person with a gender recognition certificate is legally recognised in, in their acquired gender, so as their sex. Um, so that's, that's the whole purpose of the Gender Recognition Act. Um, so if there were a women only service then a trans woman with a gender recognition certificate would be able to would be treated would be a woman and would be able to access that service a trans woman without a gender recognition certificate would be legally male and therefore that service um would they would have no automatic right of entry to that service if you like on that basis um however in both cases um, so were um, the trans woman with a GRC to be excluded from that service, that would be direct discrimination, direct gender reassignment discrimination, unless it could be objectively justified. And were a, a trans woman without a GRC excluded from that service, then that could be indirect gender reassignment discrimination. Um, unless it could be objectively justified. In the High Court of Northern Ireland last year, Mr Justice Schofield described a gender recognition certificate as conferring, and I quote, a significant and formal change in a person's status with potentially far-reaching consequences for them and for others, including the state. These far-reaching consequences flow mainly from two sections of the Act not mentioned by name in the Commission's sessions so far. Section 9 sets out the effect of a GRC 
It provides that a person's acquired gender becomes, for all purposes in law, except in a few defined circumstances, their sex. Section 22 puts in place stringent privacy protections. It creates criminal offences for disclosing any information about a person's past identity or current status as a GRC holder. If that knowledge was gained in an official capacity, again with limited exceptions. A key question for the committee is how these two sections interact with the Equality Act. We and others sent in a joint briefing to you about this following comments made in the first public session. We highlighted that the legal position here is unsettled and that several influential organisations believe the GRC does change somebody's sex under the Equality Act with implications for how organisations can practically provide single sex services in line with the law. I'll mention one example from our briefing. In 2017, a Scottish Government email recorded a member of the Equality Network staff telling civil servants that the use of sex and gender interchangeably in Section 9 was, quote, intentional and should be retained. And the wording's purpose was to make sure that GRC holders would not be prevented from accessing services based on their acquired gender. In a further internal note, a civil servant then recorded that for the government was keeping this wording in Section 9, quote, for policy reasons. It's clear, therefore, that in developing this bill, both the Scottish Government and the Equality Network have viewed GRCs as much more than just a piece of paper. That was in 2017. Much more recently, the Scottish Government has again demonstrated its belief that a GRC changes someone's sex for the purpose of the Equality Act, and Susan will say more about that. In public, Government and its supporters may maintain that GRA reform, as proposed here, will not affect the operation of the Equality Act, but the Committee needs to dig much deeper into that. We are, of course, at a disadvantage here because the minutes of the Committee's private briefing with civil servants in March do not record what they said to you about this. But think of it this way. If a GRC is a sort of key and you're going to hand out lots more copies to a more diverse group, the first job of legislators is to be really clear about what that key could unlock. For Women Scotland recently won a case in the highest court in Scotland over the definition of women in the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act. In the ruling, the judges said that provisions in favour of women by definition exclude those who are biologically male. They determined the definition in the statutory guidance based on self-ID should be struck out. However, the Scottish Government's proposed correction is to define women on the basis of Section 212 of the Equality Act plus those in possession of a GRC who have changed their legal sex to female. In short, while ministers and civil servants may swear blind to this committee that a GRC does not change a person's sex under the Equality Act, this Act suggests they don't really believe it. The GRC, as Lucy said, conflates sex and gender. Meanwhile, confusion and coordinated campaigns have undermined how single-sex spaces operate, and this is reflected in the submissions you've received, in policy documents and in workplace guidance. We think many have the law hopelessly tangled, but while the Scottish Government are not prepared to defend women's rights, reform will make things immeasurably worse. Another bad law will, like others before, end in the courts. By doing away with all eligibility criteria, this bill effectively opens up the process to everyone. There is a frankly naive expectation that no one will act dishonestly and that solemn declarations are the most binding of magic. While much has been made of the vulnerability of trans-identified people, there has been little recognition that the people who will suffer under the loss of single-sex spaces, which providers will find increasingly difficult to operate, are genuinely some of the most marginalised and abused in Scotland today. While the committee took private evidence from selected individuals, some of which related to experience rather than the application of law, I recently listened to heartrending accounts of women who have self-excluded from women's services and the evidence of how trauma has ripped their lives apart. These women have then been demonised sometimes by the very organisations who were supposed to protect them and betrayed by those who should have supported them. If lived experience matters to the committee, theirs should too. Frontline workers and board members have told us that the women at the top of the funded organisations did not consult independent centres before declaring for self-ID. 
Many try to maintain a de facto single-sex policy in spite of this. There will be a larger cohort of people who are able to identify as females and take advantage of positive action measures, including those that have been directed at females because of historic disadvantage. Now, trans women may well experience historic disadvantage as well, but for different reasons. So for females, those biological women who've lived as women for the whole of their lives, gone through the education system as girls, experienced the disadvantage that girls often experience, like being rooted into different courses, non-sciences and so on, there may be positive action measures directed at them, uh, but um, uh, trans women with GRCs will become entitled because they will fall within the cohort of women um, uh, to whom eventually uh, these provisions are addressed, even though they may not be the disadvantaged group. You're looking at average pay. If you have a trans woman who has gone through their career as a male, their pay will be higher and may conceal disparities between men and women pay, particularly when we've got the sorts of I mean, you've had it in Scotland, you know, local authority pay disparities and so on. So that's an issue the committee should just be alive to in my, uh, my observation um, and perhaps think about that. Karen, just a little bit on the um, uh, minority groups, obviously, that's yes. other area. So. Sorry, that was the other area. Um, yes, as I've said, um, where a, uh, a trans woman has a gender recognition certificate, then they can't be excluded from a female space unless that female space is able to meet the threshold of justification. It might be a small organisation, for example. If you've got a small sexual advice, sorry, uh, 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 a small sexual counselling service, for example, or a swimming facility that's used commonly by minority women, they may not be able to use that facility if trans women are admitted. Now, there's no point saying, well, they ought not to think that or that ought not to happen. That is the reality. And often they're the most marginalised communities, certainly in some areas, the most marginalised, and they may be excluded from certain services if trans women are permitted access. Specific sensitivities to women who've suffered sexual violence are, of course, necessary. Um, but that shouldn't be confined, that mustn't be confi confined to services specifically for those women. The problem is that we don't know, nobody knows, at the swimming pool, at the gym, at the public toilets, at the library, wherever, um, you don't know which women using those services have suffered sexual violence, which women are traumatised, carry trauma from male violence, and they need to be, be able to use those services freely. Um, without making a declaration about their past. So you should, as a traumatised woman who has suffered sexual violence, be able to use the loo at the library, um, for example, um, without having those traumas triggered. Single sex service. The starting point is that those without a GRC can be excluded if they're not of the sex that the service is serving. So a trans woman without a GRC can be excluded from a uh, female only service just for clarity there may be circumstances where justification is required but it's complex and the key issue is the starting point is in terms of whether or not people can still be excluded after this proposed system if it were introduced that part of the law remains unchanged people could still be excluded whether or not they had a grc and um, if there are more people with grcs then potentially there are more people who could be excluded but again the bar for exclusion is high. I mean, what we are seeing um, is a steady erosion of the ability to protect single sex spaces on the basis that they're simply obviously single sex. So if you say anyone who identifies as a woman can have a gender recognition certificate and give the impression, and the impression will be widely given, that especially anyone with a gender recognition certificate is entitled to access any single sex service, um, and nobody can um, deny them that then you create a situation in which um, it's impossible ever to challenge someone who oughtn't to be there.
um, you see someone who looks like a man, and you don't know whether he identifies as a woman. You don't know whether he might have a gender recognition certificate. He may be dressed as a woman, but you don't know whether he's an erotic cross-dresser, a trans person with gender dysphoria, but no gender recognition certificate, somebody fully medically transitioned with a gender recognition certificate. You don't know what his status is, um, but you ought to be able to say, um, these are my boundaries. Um, I've consented to take my clothes off or whatever it is in this space that I've been told is a women only space. And it's the impact on me that matters. It's the impact on the general user of that space that matters. Once you think about the proportionality of the fact that as soon as you've admitted one male person to a space where women want to take their clothes off, to take an example, um, you have spoiled it for all the women. You have made it not, it is no longer a women only space. It's not single sex, it's mixed. So when you're looking at the proportionality, the justification of maintaining single sex spaces, um, it seems to me pretty much inevitable that you're always going to come to the same conclusion. As soon as you make this, admit one man um, or one male person identifying as female, um, it is no long, longer a single sex space, it's a mixed space and it's lost all its purpose. No woman can be confident that it's a single sex space. We must also n not lose track of women from minority communities who may be especially impacted by liberal rules in relation to GRCs and they are often the most vulnerable women. Single sex providers can impose blanket bans on services. I think that there, there, there has been discussions about case by case, but actually if you go back to the Equality Act itself, it says you can, a service can impose a blanket ban. But what is not being looked at is how, how they can do that in practice. And one of the things that um, we have found as we've tracked back through some of the, the conversations on this, we know that organisations were arguing in 2009 when the Equality Act came in and then later at committee in Westminster in 2015 that single sex exemptions and the genuine occupational requirement were, um, were, were discriminatory and should be taken out of the Equality Act because they wanted everything on the basis of gender identity, they didn't see the need for sex provisions. That obviously didn't happen and subsequently the argument changed. It's very interesting to see how the argument changed at that period and it went from saying these, these exceptions are awful because they're excluding um, people who have a gender identity that is different to their sex to arguing that these exceptions made no difference in practice, which was a, a, a an interesting and revealing turnaround. The critical thing here is that everybody should have provision. And I think that's in the new EHRC guidance, that everybody should have the dignity of being provided for and looked after. But don't remove the dignity or the ability of women to be able to operate those spaces. And I know that there are women who work on the front line in the violence against women sector. There, there are even some of the women who are incredibly brave who have spoken out, who, who have said that they would be prepared to come to committee. I would, I would suggest in that context you would give them a private session who have had real issues with accessing services and it's something that um, women and girls in Scotland their their huge report on self-exclusion that really needs to be looked at and that is in terms of policy and how policy has been affected by GRA Equality Act interaction. Actually the UK is quite interesting in that we have specifically provided for carve-outs and exceptions where we think that there's going to be bad faith actors. So actually some of the protections that we would want to see within segregated spaces, for example, within sport, within prisons, already exist. And there's no reason to suggest why those also wouldn't work under this new system. If, guarantee, if having a gender recognition certificate doesn't guarantee you access to a prison, or when you're in a prison, doesn't guarantee you being able to change a state, well then there's no reason to understand, there's no reason to question why that case-by-case -case analysis couldn't happen.
I actually happen to believe that when we're legislating, we do need to think about what's not just probable, but what's also potential. I think that's an appropriate way in which we consider. However, what I do slightly worry about is where we seem on the conversation about gender recognition to always start from the image of the trans rapist, of the person in the bathroom who's going to mug you. I tend to believe that bad faith actor arguments are a problem that stem from cisgender men, not trans women. Um, if you are arguing that a bad faith actor is going to try and obtain a GRC in order to gain access to uh, women's spaces, which seems to be the, the main argument that is made against it, then um, I would say that that is, is not, is not a, a trans person seeking a GRC. That is an abuser seeking a GRC. When it comes to spaces like toilets and changing rooms, society has moved very far from um, what I still remember from many years ago, where you could go into a changing room and it was literally a room in which everyone changed. I have not seen that for many, many years. And I think um, we've, we've moved very far towards finding a way of providing private spaces for every individual and it's much more the default position now that you have cubicles and um, it, it's you'd have to look again at the at the specifics but if you have a reasonably spacious communal area plus individual cubicles then it, it's difficult to see that there is a, a major issue. Um, I had a consultation and 59% of people that are, um spoke about this bill opposed the principles of the bill. It was quite a considerable number. For the convener, they said, uh, Amnesty said that they must be justified on the basis of, they are justified on the basis of quite stringent criteria. So therefore, do you think, from a human rights angle, in terms of uh, women's views of um, safeguards and opt-outs, that that should actually be made simpler in law so that the exemptions are there and those women feel protected for the, for the reasons that we're hearing? If we're looking at the Equality Act and we're saying that we have concerns about the way certain uh, exemptions or specifics apply, we need to be very particular about what we mean, um, which provision, in what context, what's not working. And our assessment is that the exemptions that are available do appear to work and the evidence that's been given to this committee has shown that, that they work uh, in prisons, in single-sex services, in special services for, uh, for those who've suffered violence and gender-based violence. Um, and what we haven't heard is evidence that they're not working leave it there but un unfortunately it, there are people who are self-excluding because they don't want to come out and actually say um, what they're experiencing so they don't access services because of their fears or concerns. Going back to this discrimination effect and changing your sex, if you have a change of sex in law, you can bring direct discrimination cases, and that changes things, that changes your ability. It's much easier to bring a direct discrimination case, and providers will will take that into account. It's one of the things they look at the risk analysis of how they're going to set their policy, what's going to happen, what's the bigger risk that I get this kind of case from someone claiming direct discrimination, who is trans, but now has a female GRC, or I get an indirect discrimination case from some, say, Muslim women um, that we're being discriminated against, or women who have women in general saying that we, we will not be able to use this space. And they will always worry more about the direct discrimination case. The direction of movement for prisons policy is to treat a transgender prisoner with a GRC differently to a transgender prisoner without. That is to say, as a prisoner of the sex corresponding to their acquired gender. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, I, I could give just one example. I mean, there, there was a prisoner, someone who's now a prisoner in Ireland, um, who was refused a diagnosis of gender dysphoria at a clinic in England, and so was unable to pursue a GRC through that route, but who then, on the basis of self-ID, was able to obtain a GRC in Ireland. Um, and the impact of the management of that prisoner um, within the female estate has been catastrophic.
the allocation decisions are purely on the basis of GRC status. We know that there are prisoners with a GRC who've been convicted of the most serious violent and sexual offences against women and who have intact male genitalia. They pose a real risk. So we've got the question of allocation. Then we've got the question of management and the fact that when a policy privileges GR status in this way, any ability for the prison service to conduct these sort of case-by-case -case assessments and this flexibility in how you manage this cohort of prisoners is drastically reduced. So if we look at the example which was reported in the media over the weekend, which was of a male-bodied prisoner, trans woman prisoner, with a GRC, with intact male genitalia, who had, as was reported, consensual sex with a very young female prisoner. If that prisoner had not had a GRC, firstly, they probably wouldn't have been in the female estate to start with, because the things like anatomy are taken into consideration when making those decisions. But now, where is that prisoner to be moved to? If that prisoner had not had a GRC, they would have been moved back to the male estate as clearly posing an unmanageable risk, which puts women in prison at risk of pregnancy for a start. But because that prisoner has a GRC, they can't be moved to the male estate. They have to be managed within the female estate. So that prisoner has been moved to another women's prison to temporarily be housed on the unit known as E-Wing, the transgender unit, quote unquote, which is where prisoners, male prisoners, trans women with a GRC, who pose a level of risk that cannot be managed in the main population of the female estate, they're held there temporarily and then assisted in progressing back to the female prison estate, to the general population. A convener, committee members, I see today's uh, meeting as an opportunity, one to reaffirm the Scottish Prison Service's commitment to creating a culture where equality of opportunity, diversity and human rights are actively valued and promoted and where discrimination is not tolerated. To be clear about our commitment to progressing, protecting and promoting the rights of all of the people we care for in Scotland's prisons. To illustrate our, that our individualised risk assessment approach to the placement and management of those in our care does not conflict with our continuing strong commitment to advance equality and protect the rights of all and is consistent with our wider commitment to the health, safety and well-being of the people who live and work in Scottish prisons that as of December the 3rd, 2021, there was 11 trans women held in the Scottish Prison Service and that more than half are housed in female estate. Of those that are not, why is that? And are they without a GRC? No, a GRC would be one, albeit important, element of the consideration. So, um, broadly speaking, we would consider the, the wishes and welfare of the person concerned, whether or not they had a GRC or, or whether it was a, a social gender. Um, issue we would uh, consider where they wanted to be located. Part of that consideration would be the welfare of other people in that location, uh, whether it be men or women, uh, and whether it be the male or female estate. Part would be access to services, and part would be cell sharing in terms of whether or not single cell occupancy. Uh, we, the reason we can't tell you how many people have a GRC is because we, people don't need to divulge that to us. I just want some clarity around the um, part 13 um, in the young Offend yeah, Prisons and Young Offenders Institutions Scotland Rules 2011. How does that work with um, the policy that you have? So in, in those particular uh, rules, it states that female prisoners must not share the same accommodation as male prisoners. But is it the current policy which states accommodation policy should reflect the gender in which the person in custody is living in breach of those rules? If how do those work together? The, the policy tries to um, um, fulfil all, all of our statutory and regulatory obligations in the right way, um, you know, in, in, in accordance with the expectations of SPS as a public body and a, and, and a prison service, including the prison rules and how they're interpreted. Um, so it, it looks, it fully respects gender identity, but it also takes into account uh, the, um, uh, any risks or needs or vulnerabilities that, that we identify through the multi-agency case conference. What happens if there was a legal challenge? 
it's our position that a, a gender recognition certificate is a factor that we have to take into account when deciding on how to place and manage people in our care, but it's not the only factor. As I was saying earlier on, a risk assessment, as panel members, committee members will be aware, is, is not an exact science. Um, so, to answer your question, how would we respond to a legal challenge, or could that actually happen? Yes, of course it, it could. about how much the harm that a, um, a process that we currently has on individuals with any potential harm um, to that self-ID might bring in. At the moment, we're not seeing that as comparable to the actual harm that it's doing to trans people who are not able to obtain a gender recognition certificate um, through a self-ID process. And in fact, um, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board pointed this out, that they were worried about if, they, if you were giving people a piece of paper that said um, legally the other sex, that that would increase pressure on services. And of course, the last thing anybody would want to do is increase the pressure on the NHS services. Um, and I know that there are, there are some, um, some of the medics who'd worked at the Tavistock and so on have, have a lot of concerns about them. So they, they would be good people to, to have to explore this further. There are GPs and medical practitioners that we would really would urge you to speak to as part of your inquiry who are worried very much about this, this, this leaking, this, this reverse almost pressure that you would create, particularly for young people. Could, could you set out in your view the legal, what, what in this legislation would relate to the CAS review and why having a gender recognition certificate or not would then lead to um, a process of, of, of medical um, transition, which is the, the increase in the cash review, I think, is, is alluding to. I think the implication was that somehow um, the other way around, that somehow reforming legal gender recognition will have an impact on um, whether young people seek um, medical interventions in their treatment. But I think the important thing about this reform is it's actually seeking to set apart um, a decision around any form of medical medicalisation or medical treatment from the simple legal procedure of applying to change um, to change uh, your birth certificate. Do you think that, in, uh, that basically uh, the numbers will increase with the GRC coming in? The GRC, that's a substantial act that they've taken and it's relevant to their discussions they will have with their clinicians um, <coughs> uh, in the gender identity clinic. However, it's one of a, a, a multitude of different uh, aspects that we will be looking at and thinking about. The Royal College of General Practitioners Scotland submitted written evidence whereby they stated that current IT systems do not accommodate for transgender and non-binary patients, stating that the trans male cannot be referred for a cervical smear or to a gynaecology clinic if they are recorded as a male in the database despite having female reproductive organs. With an anticipated inflation in the number of GRC applications, do you have any concerns about decoupling of the legal and medical aspect of the gender reassignment? I'm uncertain about uh, the situation regarding gynaecology. I've got figures to the end of uh, the final caution 21-22, so that's the end of March this year. Um, we have 4,000 people waiting. Uh, to be seen for an initial appointment in Scotland, just over 4,000 people, of whom 1,037 are young people. Has that been a fairly static figure, or has it been increasing? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to see the small print on my, my sheet here. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking that two years ago, if I'm reading this correctly, it certainly looks from the size of the graphic, it, it's, it's about doubled uh, as for us the number of people waiting since the same period uh, two years ago. But, uh, and actually, out of the trans people I interviewed, I mean, 
some of them may well favour treatment on demand based on their own self-declared gender, but uh, a lot of them were mainly arguing for a movement back towards this kind of shared decision-making informed consent model. People feel that they want to express their identity in their NHS record. And I think what we need to, to be explaining to people about data collection, is this, this relates a bit to what Robin was saying earlier, Robin was taking the attitude, well, people have got their identities and they need to be able to express them. That's absolutely fine. But what we're interested in data is not making a judgment on people. It's just having accurate information. And so if you don't have accurate information on your health record, then that will have unintended consequences that you're not called in for screening, that you should be called in for because your body is what it is. Um, and then there's also implications for research where you've got, you know, people misclassified um, as the opposite sex, when actually that's reflecting their identity, which is different from their sex. So I think if we could just kind of explain to people, these are two different things. Let's respect both of these things. Medical screening occurs according to the, the gender marker in your records. Um, so. And we know there are there have been cases of people not receiving appropriate screening because their gender marker is reflecting their gender identity and not their sex. I want to be really clear about because I, I understand the concerns about confidentiality, but this data should absolutely always be confidential. And just to say with sex, it is a systematic variable. It doesn't just affect you know, it's not a, a cluster of bits and pieces um, where you know you just need to know about this organ or that organ. It's a systematic variable that affects every aspect of your health and every cell in your body has a sex. So not just your prostate, um, not just your uterus, every cell in your body has a sex and that means you can respond differently to different treatments. Um, why does changing the process for getting a GRC have, have the impact that, that you, claim, you claim it does? Yeah, so, and again, I want to come back to the unintended consequences of creating um, a, an environment where people f find it very, very difficult to acknowledge sex. Um, if it's if it's very easy to replace your sex with your gender identity in law, then how is a service provider or um, or a data controller going to turn around and say, oh well, this is acknowledged legally, but we're not going to acknowledge it? Um, they, I agree, in principle, they could. But I, th I think you'd need to think very carefully about how you're going to make really, really clear, not only that they can do that, but you actively want them to. Um, so we've seen a lot of um, language, which I think has been criticized as being both unclear and dehumanizing, um, particularly around women. And so, for example, there was a notorious um, issue of the Lancet where they talked about um, people with vaginas and I'm, I'm sure you'd agree <laughs> that, Karen, that, you know, that's not, that's not necessarily how we want to be referred to people with vaginas. If you ask people things like, uh, do you have a prostate? Do you have a uterus? It's not the clearest communication. So I, I think whether we're collecting data or whether we're communicating with people in other ways, we just need to be clear and accurate and communicate with people that we're not making judgments about them. Um, you know, when we when we collect data, it, you know, to come back to something Robin said, it should absolutely always be confidential. It's never about outing people. And I think if people understood that the way that data is handled really, really carefully, then maybe that would give them some reassurance. As you'll probably be aware, if someone wishes to choose the sex of their nurse or doctor, they are free to ask. So, for example, if a female goes into uh, you know, doctor surgery and is getting a smear test done, she can ask to be, if it can be completed by a female doctor. They have the right to ask for that. If a doctor or nurse is transgender and a patient is not aware of this, and as we've heard from many witnesses before, that there's no requirements to disclose this information to the patient, this could interfere with religious practices whereby Women are not allowed to be touched by men. This is of great importance to many, especially from the BAME community. I raised this concern last week, and I, may, and I really do have to put it on the record and make this very clear for everybody listening. At no time am I saying that the trans rights do not matter. 
nor am I saying religious rights do not matter. This is about creating a practical balance between two sensitive area, rights and liberties. These are concerns that have been highlighted to me, to me by many. Sorry, I need to really break this down. Sorry, convener, this is very important. Um, so if a trans person that was a male before and now trans and um, uh, examined that Muslim lady, right, and she did not know you're breaking her religion by basically her religion does not state that another person, uh, but, but a female, can basically um, examine her. So I'm trying to break this down. Um, a ver the very brave author on Jolly Ralph, who um, has, stands up for refugees and has stood up and said that single sex spaces are important for Muslim women, and the abuse that she has got has been sexist and Islamophobic and racist. But it is really important as well to know that um, in having our, um, our rights in certain areas protected, it doesn't give us absolute rights over other things. So just to be really stark, if, for example, my mother had said to me that I actually only want a Chinese doctor, Right. That is not necessarily going to be an expectation that can be met. So there are some areas in which we allow people because we're thinking carefully about things like access to medical care, appropriateness, computing rights and so on, um, that that would be that, that is something for us to consider. And there are other areas where um, the National Health Service makes a decision about the processes in place. Um, and those are clear and transparent processes probably best to um, ask a health professional organisation with this, but I know that they will be having to deal on a daily basis with people who have certain views, um, because again, uh, the right to faith is also um, around thought as well. Those who may have, for example, racist views and don't want to be seen by um, a doctor of colour or, or other, um, and the National Health Service will have procedures in place for something like that, because I'm sure that unfortunately happens um, far too regularly. Um... Uh, religious religious belief is part of a protected characteristic in the Equalities Act. Um, so, s for the BAME community that you're speaking about, um, I would expect that their religious belief to be respected when they are um, interacting with medical profession or any other, I would expect their belief systems to be respected. I think it's incumbent upon the, the Scottish Government and the Parliament to ensure that those who express the view that sex and gender are immutable and thus reject the idea of gender as fluid and separable from biological sex are free to do so. I think that needs to be protected. I think that's particularly important for those who work in education, healthcare, marriage celebrants, prison staff and religious representatives, among others. Um, certainly from a Catholic Church position, I would argue that we should be able to declare the marriages of people uh, in accordance with their own teaching, which is something that's already protected and it should be preserved. Uh, and I think that's obviously the case also for the teachings of other religious bodies and, and groups uh, as well. Um, freedom of thought, conscience and religion, free speech, freedom of expression and association, all of these fundamental freedoms constitute a precious inheritance that must be preserved um, and uh, passed on intact to future generations. Just, I think it's important again to put on the record that uh, yeah, religion or belief is a protected characteristic under the Equality Act alongside uh, sex and gender reassignment. And uh, I think uh, this is the sort of thing maybe that the Equality and Human Rights Commission was referring to about its concerns about a conflict possibly of rights in certain aspects. Um, situations maybe that you've referred to Pam so so I think that is worth um, exploring a lot more and I would defer to to them about about that the NHS has a long history of being you know very aware of and sensitive to individual religious beliefs if you look at their guidance on treatment for example blood transfusions and people who refuse to accept blood transfusions for religious reasons I have no reason to believe the NHS would have a, a huge difficulty in doing the same for this particular issue Can you just touch a little bit on um, the women of faith here? The fact that if it's a religion or certain things, you've probably heard in past um, committee meetings we've discussed this, that how do we feel them not feeling excluded, whether it's in a swimming changing room? Um, you know, are they going backwards? The fact that, you know, we have heard in a private session, I'm not allowed, if I'm not allowed to say this, say, that it's just a little bit about the fact that, 
people shopping online and going into changing rooms and then they decide that, hold on, we just shop online so we don't want to go out to a changing room in case somebody else is there. So it's just on that, that how do we make sure that everybody's um, you know, included, not excluded there? Naomi, just a little bit on that. Um, I, mean, I think this is a huge problem and, and insufficiently examined so far, um, that if you make all single sex spaces and services um, in effect mixed spaces because you all, all mixed spaces from the point of view of women with particular beliefs and women from particular faith groups um, mm -hmm. then you are liable to create a situation where women in those groups are effectively excluded from all kinds of aspects of public life they won't they, uh, which may be necessary to their inclusion in society as as full members of a democracy maybe um, they may be denied access to the library because they can't go far enough from home without using the loo, without using the loo and they can't be confident that the toilet is a single sex space they may not use the gym which is important to their health um, because they've attended a women only swimming session which without which they might not feel comfortable or might even not have permission of their families to attend um, the swimming pool. Um, they find a trans-identifying male in that swimming session and they leave and they never come back. And we won't necessarily know about these effects. We'll just, we'll just create a gradual chilling effect where women from s s certain sections of society um, simply self-exclude. Um, and possibly the worst of those is self-exclusion from rape crisis and domestic violence um, uh, uh, services, because that really is p piling disadvantage on disadvantage. Let's realistically and objectively assess whether or not that conflict really exists, because I think too often sometimes we're very quick to, to see the conflict, but where it does, absolutely, let's have a conversation about balancing people's rights. Um, it's just to get some um, examples of countries that um, have impact studies on uh, the particular issues that Pam has just explored, if you may. Thank you. I'm not sure if there is, but absolutely very, very happy to look at. I'm very much happy to go. Off the top of my head, I haven't actually seen anything which specifically looks at that issue. Whether it's to single sex spaces or whether it's to single sex um, services. Um, I, mean, I, I come at this from the point of view that trans women are women and trans men are men. And therefore, if a trans woman is accessing a woman's space, then she is in the correct place. Section 22 interferes with freedom of religion. For instance, where it goes against a woman's religious practices to be touched by a man. So basically, going into doctor surgery, uh, just an example I've mentioned uh, before, is going for a smear test. And um, in the practice, you can ask for a female doctor. That's quite normal. My own mother does it, you know, and a lot of my um, relatives and friends. However, given the individual with a GRC do not have to disclose this, uh, as there's a possibility that a woman could end up see, be seen by a biological male. Obviously, with the GRA reform, it could be more widespread. And to ask you that, are you aware of this issue existing before this bill and how you seek to address it? If a patient specifically requests a, a, a doctor or nurse of the same gender for whatever reason, then, of course, the NHS will try to accommodate that as far as possible. There are obviously, there's never, never any guarantees for that because of the availability of staff with appropriate skills to, to manage the patient's uh, condition. There's also the, the general occupation requirement exception, which can provide that a person appointed must not be a trans person where there is uh, an occupational requirement uh, due to the nature of the context of the work. So there's a lot, I think, of, um, of I guess, safeguards um, uh, that you could describe. I mean, in terms of someone who you know, doesn't disclose, um, I mean, you know, again, I would have thought that is something for the employer uh, to, to deal with. I mean, we're talking about very hypothetical situations here. I can't imagine that you know, most people, particularly that are in the caring professions, would want to do anything other than to have the person's wishes respected. Mm -hmm.
Could you tell us anything about the use of self-ID internationally that you've learned from your work with partners or, or anything else? Um, and do you have any evidence that you could share with us just now which can speak to the impact of self-declaration on trans people and also on the impact of self-declaration on women? Um, I think uh, when our board considered these issues in, in the round, as we discussed in our opening statement, part, part of that was to look at international competitors. Um, the current UK legislation sits kind of somewhere in the middle between, um, as you say, countries that focus more on self-identification or declaration, some of which are quite close to us, Ireland and some Nordic countries and other European countries. There are other countries internationally which require some kind of medical process in order um, uh, to undergo this transition. And obviously the UK, the UK legislation sits somewhere in, in the middle in terms of the gender dysphoria diagnosis and other conditions. Um, we, our board did consider those uh, issues. I think the evidence is, is, is still emerging um, on the impact. In, a, in all of that work, have you got any evidence of any abuse of the self-ID system? Our emphasis has been less about the, any abuse of the system, but rather understanding the implications of, of broadening access to, to this process and what that means for, for services and uh, for data collection and so on. So that's been more our emphasis. Okay, and, and, in, and in looking at that and in broadening it, you haven't found any evidence of a negative impact? Um, I, think, I think the evidence is still, is still emerging. The international evidence says, first of all, that it depends on the legal framework. So not every country that does a GRC is going to give you Section 22 type protections. That's very important. Um, not every country that does a GRC is going to have overlaps with, well, we don't know, the relationship between, say, prison rules or single sex services will vary. The Scottish Government, I'm pretty sure I need to check, but I think we asked them if they had any, um, were able to provide, um, you know, how did, what is it in Denmark, Norway? How do these things, what is the bigger legal framework within to which a gender recognition certificate sits? And as far as we can see, there's no analysis available of that, nothing at all. So that's the first thing about international comparisons. If you don't know what it's dovetailing with, it's very difficult to say. Second thing about international comparisons, nowhere that's done self-declaration has it put in place any monitoring. And I think, I think the Scottish <coughs> Government has told us that it does know that. But that is a fundamental problem looking for international comparisons. What I would say as a committee you have to do is, is not latch on to absence of evidence, meaning evidence of absence, which is an extremely insecure way to legislate. I realise that others have brought up some um, kind of individual cases. They're ones that, um, again, we don't take our evidence on the basis of newspaper reports or blogs. We do need to independently rep. rep verify them um, and we haven't found it to be um, a huge problem. And also just to say it from a European comparison perspective, um, in the Netherlands their gender recognition system requires supporting expert opinion and the vast majority of EU member states like uh, Croatia, Finland, Germany and Sweden all require um, supporting medical documentation so we wouldn't be necessarily out of step by, by keeping some aspect of um, medical documentation. I, th I think the legislation in Ireland has also been referred to by uh, in, in the committee previously. Um, so for their gender recognition uh, process for 16 and 17 year olds, it requires an application to a government minister, a court order process, parental consent and medical certification from two doctors, so a medical practitioner and a psychiatrist or endocrinologist. As a result of this work, I uh, was able to arrive to three main conclusions. The first one is that legal recognition of uh, gender identity is a key to ensuring the deconstruction of institutional and social drivers of discrimination and violence that affects so many persons around the world. The second one, that certain, certain requirements are uh, recommended and dictated by international human rights law in relation to the processes of legal recognition, including the fact that it should be accessible, that it should be um, fast, and that it should be widely available, along with other requirements that I'd be happy to elaborate upon. And finally, that gender identity is protected by a robust corpus juris under international human rights law as a trait protected from discrimination and violence 
you you've stated uh, some countries that now have self ID but in some of those countries medical documentation might be required to be produced so um, I mean we don't have a standardized approach I personally find the um, the Maltese system to be um, a, high, a high standard for human rights I think the Danish system which obviously Dr Dietz can give more um, more detail on uh, is a good system. I think Iceland has recently adopted a very good um, gender recognition law based on self-identification with provisions, um, I believe, for some minors um, with parental support. I think self-declaration in general is the most human rights compliant system with, with that depathologisation that my colleagues have um, have discussed as well. Dr Duffy, just on um, the... Thank you for that, by the way. Um, on the the requirement for um, documentation in other countries like Croatia, Finland, uh, Germany. Um, well, why did they come to that decision um, rather than the examples that you've given where no medical documentation is required? Although it is accepted as a human rights standard, um, that depathologization is the uh, kind of the gold standard for, for um, legal gender recognition, there is currently no legal requirement to depathologize one's uh, legislation. I think what I would say is when we're thinking about medicalisation, we have seen some jurisdictions which have specifically put into their law that this process is not going to be medicalised. So the really good example is Malta, which really makes that strong affirmative statement. Can you, can you tell us um, from experience um, elsewhere, are there any countries who have monitored the impact of self-identification on the use of single-sex spaces? aware of research on that from the countries that I would be conversant with the, the law in. There has not been widespread abuse of the process or an unexpectedly large number of applications. There has not been widespread reports of abusive use of the process by cisgender men to access women's spaces such as changing rooms or bathrooms. say that I don't think there is a significant amount of research out there which has looked at specifically the question of monitoring. And so there's no point, I'm, 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 you know, I, I wouldn't equivocate on that from my perspective, I don't think there is. But I do think there's a couple of things. So we haven't seen abuse in Ireland and certainly I would say anecdotally I could add to that and say I haven't heard of abuse. The final what I would say, say is that there has been more general studies in the last two years or so about how legal gender recognition operates uh, in the Council of Europe and happens in the European Union. And no, they have not specifically looked at how single sex spaces might be affected. but who then on the basis of self-ID was able to obtain a GRC in Ireland um, and the impact of the management of that prisoner um, within the female estate has been catastrophic. <laughs>
just more about the gender pay gap because we have heard this from some of the witnesses that have come forward to talk about that. So just a little bit about you know, your concerns but, and your thoughts on how you tackled this area. Um, again, embarrassingly so, none of these things were identified as issues around the time of the enactment of the legislation. And so because of the way the legislation was drafted, there is no data collection other than in the general registered office, I would present and change my gender and all of my legal documents would go from being a she to whatever I would identify as. Um, and so insofar as collecting data to feed into justice legislation, employment legislation, um, it's not there. And I just wondered how, how do you think the different terms used in data collection impact on the policy development, for example, in health and criminal justice? I think it impacts hugely. How can we guarantee, how can we ensure that uh, trans men will still be on the right registers for cervical screening for, 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 those, for those kinds of tests and trans women will still be on the right lists for prostate tests and, 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 and that kind of thing. That, that data would be collected within the GRO. But because of data protection and the GDPR legislation that we've all got from the European Union, um, that data can't be shared with anybody. So even if we could, you know, delve into that data to say actually there are there are 50 women in, in, are in Dublin that change their gender to men, let's make sure we capture them for cervical screening or for breast check or whatever it happens to be. Um, we, we don't have the ability to access that right now. But in Ireland, the, the, the cases that you have referred to um, with males with GLCs being sent to prison, did you do any analysis prior to or during the evidence uh, sessions of the bill to work out the impact of males with GLCs um, being housed in female prisons? So what we did do at the time um, was look at other jurisdictions that had passed similar legislation to us and the lived experience in that country. Um, and again, probably because we were one of one of the first, and you're nearly one of the first countries to introduce this kind of legislation, um, there wasn't an awful lot to look at. Um, but, but we did do some work. Um, the prison thing, the shared dressing room spaces um, and the school toilets were the three things that came up in the jurisdictions that we looked at. But again, the instances were so minute and that when you balanced it against the fact that, like, do we really believe that there was going, like, first of all, if, if, if you can hold in your mind that the, the, the passing of the legislation is a good thing for the people that need it, to need the, the legal recognition to live their lives, and if you balance it against the fear of not doing it because somebody might declare themselves as a female to get but, access but, to sorry. females. I genuinely think we have a debate that happened a number of months ago because we have a number of prisoners in Limerick Prison um, in the southwest of our country who are in a female prison um, who identified as female after they had been. Um, so to, to our mind, to change the legislation to have the massive positive impact on a very small community's life was a very good thing for us to do. If we could help those people in that community, whatever of the gender that they were, outside of male and female, to live a fulfilled life recognised by the state, it was a good thing to do. What I'm suggesting to you is, is that some of the concerns that were raised at the time was those um, spaces, female-only spaces. And so prisons is one that's used a lot, dressing rooms are used. Um, particularly around our children, the example of, of toilets in, in secondary schools or primary schools are used. And when we balanced and looked at other jurisdictions, had those problems or issues materialised, there were very, very little evidence to say that they had. How did you go about addressing that? that did you have other groups of religion, women of faith, uh, whether they were uh, you know, accessing services or single-sex spaces that... Did that come across any of the work you were doing in your 2015 Act? Again, to be very honest with you, um, we had very little acrimony. Um, we did have concerns that were expressed, but they were actually expressed to us in relatively muted tones. But it would break the religion of that female 
if she was Sorry, to find, if that female was to find out later on that that doctor and she didn't have an opportunity to know anything because that trans person has the right to privacy, but also that person of religion and belief has the right to religion as well. So how do we see, you know, um, and it would be good if you could give uh, you know, some kind of answer to this, but how do we see that a happy medium that we respect both sides and we come out with a balanced view that can help that service? If we legally recognise seven genders, well, then I don't think I should have any problem telling you I'm a trans man, trans woman, non-binary, intersex, you know, non-gender. If I am that gender, like, I don't have any problem with you asking me my gender, I tell you I'm a woman. If the lads sitting around beside you, I'm quite sure that they wouldn't have any problem. So therefore, if you were a trans woman or a trans man or an intersex, you know, why would you feel, I don't know what the word is, marginalised or put upon by having to say what you are? Because to my mind, in the scenario that you've just described, each person has to be respected um, and treated with dignity. And the person that has religious beliefs has a right to be treated by a woman if she wants to be treated by a woman. If she goes in and she picks a non-binary doctor, well, then she might find it more difficult to find one. But you know what I mean? I'm not being facetious. I think there's nothing wrong with asking to be treated by a female woman doctor, as dispo you know, because there distinctly is something different between a woman and a trans woman. The concerns that perhaps are expressed by people emailing yourself or me uh, have not been found to come to fruition. So sometimes it's the concerns rather than the evidence that th those countries have then found once they have these processes in place. And I think the, the Scottish Human Rights Commission were quite clear they could find no uh, body of evidence that showed that some of those concerns about you know threat to women and girls or you know, the, the, a, a major kind of change in, in society as we know it, that, that, that did not happen in those countries. And I've got no reason to believe that Scotland would be any different. On the, on the data side, 
I referred earlier to um, the, the litigation about the census in Scotland and the census in England and Wales, um, where the courts respectively came to different views about um, the meaning of sex in, in the census. Um, and I, I, I mean, as the Equality and Human Rights Commission, we are um, very keen that um, that public bodies in particular um, in developing public policy should do so on the basis of good data. One might assume that there's no reason why the legislation we're considering would affect data collection. This would be an understandable assumption, but it would be a mistake. When the 2004 Gender Recognition Act was introduced, it was designed to cater to a tiny number of transsexual people suffering severe psychological distress. The Act was not intended to raise barriers to the collection of data on sex. And yet this has been one of the unintended consequences of the legislation. Public bodies have taken the message from the wording of Section 9 that people can switch legal sex over their lifetime, not just for certain legal purposes, but completely. And Section 22 of the Act has contributed to over-caution on the collection of data on sex. Legislators must give serious consideration to the likelihood that introducing gender self-declaration in law will reinforce an existing reluctance to ask about sex. And even small numbers of cases where sex is misclassified can introduce substantial error in data analysis particularly in cases where sex differentials are large, such as crime statistics. Where organisations adopt legal sex as an apparently safer category to ask than sex ex itself, as happened in the census in England and Wales, larger numbers of people with GRCs under self-declaration will imply a larger impact on data collection and analysis. And finally, without data on sex, as well as gender identity, we will not be able to evaluate the impact of the proposed reform. Serious policy evaluation will be rendered unfeasible. The unintended consequences, I think, is that, is that you cement this reluctance to collect data on sex, which we're seeing across a whole range of areas. Um, and, and administrative data is really important. It's not just important for effective administration and I think people sometimes don't understand this that people use administrative data for research and particularly if we don't have another census which is quite likely that we may not then admin data will be filling that gap and so it, it's hugely hugely important for research and we're, we're already seeing problems in a range of areas so in terms of the pay gap um, we're seeing um, uh, the Government Equalities Office guiding employers to, um, to exclude non-binary people from gender pay gap data. With crime, we know that the situation is really patchy. So there's been FOI requests and we know that different police services are, you know, some of them are recording crimes by male suspects as though they were committed by women if the perpetrator requests this. And that can lead to massive bias, so um, it makes it impossible to interpret trends over time in the data. Um, for example, if you've got an apparent increase in females charged with rape, you don't know, is that because there have been genuinely more female accomplices charged, or is that due to an increase in males being recorded as females? And, and then, as I noted in my opening statement, the well-being of children transitioning at the GIDS service has not been followed up over time because their NHS number changes post-transition. And so that's another example where we can't actually evaluate these dramatic changes that are going on because we don't have the data. Also, yeah. could you comment on um, why it wouldn't be right for Police Scotland to collect data on sex when it comes to more serious crimes such as domestic violence, um, murder, rape, abuse and, and such other crimes? Well, let's start with the example I gave, which is the, the current suggested guidance from the Home Office in London, which is to collect sex data on any crime. Now, if a trans person uh, is living successfully in their affirmed gender, has done for many years, um, and they're burgled, why should they have to reveal their natal sex to a police officer? Why in any way is it relevant to that crime? 
Now, that may be different, and I acknowledge it may be different in, with different crimes. And, and I haven't analysed which crimes it makes a difference in. So why is it that you have a different view to so many sort of um, senior quantitative social scientists who feel it's very important um, to collect uh, clear data on sex? Uh, to answer your first question about um, academics and researchers who, who differ in opinion to my view on the collection of data, um, I've worked in this space um, for around five years on a range of topics looking at gender, sex and sexuality, both in the UK and across Europe. Um, it's been very uncommon for me to encounter other social researchers who think we should be asking questions about biology or birth certificates. The vast majority of social researchers um, operate uh, research by asking a self-identified sex question. And there are a huge amount of academics, researchers, quantitative data experts who have also written open letters, who have written to Parliament, um, reaffirming that uh, asking a self-identified sex question poses no risk to the quality of data collected. So in my view, reforming the bill doesn't make any impact to how we're collecting data in Scotland at present. I'm a quantitative social scientist with over 20 years of experience in the collection and analysis of population data. Between 10, 2010 and 2020, I was director of the 1970 British cohort study, often described as one of the jewels in the crown of British social science. My views on the importance of sex as a basic variable which needs to be collected in both administrative and survey data are not controversial among quantitative social scientists. In 2019, 80 quantitative social scientists signed a letter I coordinated to the UK Census authorities expressing concern regarding their plans to advise respondents that they may respond to the sex question in the census in terms of their self-identified gender identity. The signatories included demographers, epidemiologists, statisticians, sociologists and economists. They included 10 fellows of the British Academy and several past and present leaders of major data sets. In 2021, Scotland's chief statistician released draft guidance stating that public bodies should not routinely collect data on sex. 91 eminent quantitative social scientists signed a letter I coordinated objecting to this guidance. These objections were ignored. Final guidance states that data on biological sex should only be recorded in a small number of instances. In contrast to this, the UK Statistics Authority guidance recommends that sex, age and ethnic group should be routinely collected and reported in all administrative data and in-service process data and should clearly distinguish between the concepts of sex, gender and gender identity. Can you comment on um, Dr Guyon's specific comments um, and the conflicts that we see amongst academics? Yes. Um, Dr. Guyan is a research fellow in theatre, film and television studies. And I would say he's not part of the quantitative social science community. He doesn't have peer reviewed publications using large scale population data, for example. So he said that his views, um, you know, that he hadn't met um, quantitative social scientists um, who disagree with him. Well, perhaps he isn't mixing so much with quantitative social scientists because he isn't one. Um, he also referred in evidence to a letter regarding Scotland's census from 300 students and staff largely based in North American universities and he sort of made out that these are quantitative social scientists too. Well actually these individuals appear to work in a range of disciplines including creative writing and theology. Um, so that's not a letter from quantitative social scientists who use population data. It's a letter from activists who happen to be based in universities. Um, and that letter actually accused advocates for the retention of sex in UK census data of taking an abominable moral position. And they likened this to slavery, eugenics, forced sterilization, and the denial of women's suffrage. So, this kind of righteous zealotry um, it is not that's not how experts speak and and it's it's part of it's a silencing technique and it's been accompanied by a more general 
stifling of discussion of sex and gender, which I've talked about. Um, accurate data on sex is fundamental to, the, to any analysis of the differences um, between women and men, boys and girls. And this drive to undermine sex-based data collection is actually, it has to be understood, I think, also as a form of silencing designed to make certain facts unknowable and unspeakable. He tried to make out that because we ask people their sex, so it's self-reported, that therefore that's the same thing as gender self-ID. Well, that's not the case. We ask people, for example, to self-report their age, but we don't tell them that they can make up whatever age they like. We ask them for accurate data. Just to, sorry, just to note as well that um, gender identity is often for the individual not a fixed quantity. Gender can be fluid. Gender is, as, as Dr. Dietz says, um, something that perhaps uh, perhaps a non-binary person uh, feels more masculine, perhaps they feel more feminine, uh, perhaps they feel um, outside the gender binary altogether. And they um, consider gender identity to be an internally felt thing and a, a sort of a, a, an innate attribute to the individual, um, which again it doesn't really um correlate to to something that has you know carceral terms and and that has um very standardized sort of um and and as i mentioned in in uh, reply to mr mcgregor um temporalized terms as well <laughs>saying uh, through this letter is that there are a number of issues that still need to be worked through when it comes to uh, the GRA reform and that this is now a good opportunity to do a comprehensive uh, adjustment uh, of the GRA because there are issues preceding the current reform that have to be uh, addressed. One of it is its relationship to the Equality Act. Uh, one of it is also the impact on single uh, sex spaces, uh, including uh, the reasons why women uh, self exclude. Uh, and so it is just taking the time to do this properly uh, and not to rush through it, uh, while at the same time uh, ensuring that uh, you know, we look at the totality of rights. Yeah, I wanted first to come back to your earlier comment about this being about culture wars. I actually don't think this is the right way to characterize this. This is about really uh, a human rights issue, fundamental human rights issues about how we have, how we can ensure the coexistence of uh, rights of different groups uh, in society in a dignified and equal way without one really erasing the other. For uh, uh, your other uh, question, I think men, much of that is actually mentioned in the um, uh, reports on the sessions that the parliamentary, uh, that the parliament has had where a number of Scottish organizations have, have come forward and have said, A, either they haven't been consulted, there have been victims that said they haven't had access really to the parliamentary committee. Uh, there have been uh, detransitioners who have been, uh, you know, uh, asked to come in very late in the process. And one thing is, of course, participation, which may or may not have happened to varying uh, degrees. But what has been clear to me also from the flurry of letters that I received uh, actually after sending my letter is that they have not been sufficiently digested, taking into consideration uh, and considered. Uh, they, uh, these persons may have been uh, consulted, but there is a difference between uh, being asked for your opinion and, and feeling that you're not heard or that whatever you say uh, actually doesn't matter. Uh, I've seen evidence. It's not uh, concentrated in one place. I've seen, you know, reports uh, also in the media by individual service providers, by organizations, testimonies by victims. As Again, uh, they're not all uh, on the same website, so to speak, you know, or you cannot just go to one place and find them. But that's also how we work, right? I mean, this is also outside of this issue. This is how I work. I uh, I'm approached by uh, victims, victim organizations. Uh, they present uh, evidence, 
and, and here evidence, uh, what counts as evidence is also their lived experience. So I, I think, you know, we, we sometimes disregard that. But as I said, when there is a lack of data or barriers to documenting and, and uh, verbalizing your concern, um, and uh, that's why, uh, you know, what has been referred to as cultural war is really not a culture war. It's about uh, it's a it's a human rights issue. It's a it's a right to to be able to have your needs uh, uh, heard and concerned uh, and addressed. The fact that data doesn't exist or isn't consolidated. I think it exists, as I said, but isn't consolidated and isn't sought for. Doesn't is not a reflection on that we don't have a problem. It's a reflection on the fact that nobody is looking for it because we have victims and women organizations telling us they've been telling us for many years now and have told us again in this context that it is a problem. Managers of prisons, they will have evidence where, um, uh, you know, violation of a single uh, sex uh, sanctity uh, for uh, female prisoners uh, has, has caused problems. The issue is, of course, it's not consolidated, it's not uh, brought together, it's not analyzed, and therefore you don't see the trends. For example, I was uh, quite um, uh, intrigued by the fact that I read in one, in one research paper that since 2018, for example, um, there's been at least 30 cases in the UK brought forward by feminists, uh, uh, NGOs, um, uh, women organizations, uh, in which they tried to challenge the erasure of single sex spaces uh, and also, um, you know, reassert their, their right to basically, uh, uh, yeah, to, to, to identification based on sex. And of course, uh, if you don't see this all brought together in one place, you would say, okay, it's not really an issue. Women are not really raising this as an issue. Uh, women, uh, they, they, there's no, you know, what's the fuss about, basically. But, um, but it is an issue, and it is an issue uh, for many. The need for dignity is, uh, is not present, that it doesn't have to be contact-based sexual violence. You know, if you have somebody in your space that will, you know, look at you, that will flash you, uh, that you are, you you know that you're fearing of, of of you know being in their in their vicinity. This is also a form of violence. So the criminalization uh, of disclosing uh, information because of the lack of funds uh, available for single sex spaces, and we've seen that uh, you know a high profile uh, person. Uh, I think last week, a uh, writer had you know decided to actually fund uh, a center in in Edinburgh because it doesn't exist. And because there is pressure uh, on uh, those that provide single-sex spaces not to do so. And by the way, this is not just in Scotland. Uh, you know, you hear this also in Canada, where it's, it's considered actually not acceptable if you want to protect that, uh, that space uh, because you're not inclusive, because you're not uh, sensitive enough. And, and actually, that is not the, even the right issue because we are saying single-sex spaces alongside uh, gender-based. So we are not saying that uh, we, we are going to abolish uh, mixed uh, uh, sex spaces. These continue to uh, exist. They exist in abundance, but the issue is to make that other option available to those who want it. And uh, I was listening to, you know, your, your question about, for example, women belonging to religious minorities. I have to say it's it's really an, a, really any victim also or anyone at risk of violence. It's not our job to second guess them or to you know uh, question why do they feel this way it's our job as states and as organizations to reduce the barriers for access and if those barriers means having you know uh, mixed uh, persons of uh, you know mixed sexes in there uh, then we have to find a solution uh, because they are often among the most vulnerable. And this is what is required by an intersectional approach, is to look at the different groups that uh, face more barriers to access uh, services, uh, you know, to that have higher rates of, of violence potentially, and to help them access the protection and assistance that they need. And to do that, we have to understand what uh, reasons they have for making decisions. And if that reasons also includes um, mixed uh, sex space, then we have to uh, 
you know, we have to work on that without passing judgments and without saying that, you know, this is, uh, I don't know, uh, transphobic or that it's uh, hate speech or uh, they're not saying the others don't exist. They're not saying they, they, they don't have their needs. They're not saying definitely that they shouldn't have access to services. They're just saying we have specific needs and we just like to have a, a space for us. Uh, that nailed with the GRC, uh, according to Lady Halden's decision, uh, uh, males with the GRC are considered uh, legally female. So, so the, the assertion by the government, or at least in some instances by the Scottish government, that there is no impact whatsoever uh, by the, the GRA on, you know, in its new form on the on the Equality Act, is actually uh, quite challenged then by by this decision.
what what this is is it's a bolt on um, onto the old onto the old act, and there are problems with the old act, as Lucy said. There are section twenty two. There are there are other issues because of this conflation of sex and gender, and that that has affected policy. We've seen that with prisons. We've seen that with some of, as I say, with some of the health boards um, policies talking about genuine occupational requirement. So. These problems existed, they are problems with, with what is already there, but when it's expanded, they become worse. And I think that's the critical aspect to take away is, you know, it's, I don't think it's, I, I think what a lot of people has, have said to us is, well, these are already problems. And that's true, but if they're already problems, they really should be sorted out before this, before this is widened. Mm -hmm.